Namibia is a vast country located in Southwest Africa, and it stands out as one of the most intriguing places globally. Larger than Texas if you were to position it off the coast of the eastern United States, it would roughly span from Boston down to Charleston, South Carolina. Surprisingly, despite its size Namibia is nearly uninhabited and essentially empty. Examining a global map of human population density focus on Africa, where there's a significant void of people in the entire southwest corner of the continent, Namibia accounts for most of this emptiness with a population of only around two and a half million people. To put it in perspective, this is comparable to the population of Western Europe. It's even fewer people than the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area in the U.S. state of Minnesota. Namibia boasts an average population density that ranks as the second lowest in the world, with approximately three people per square kilometer of land. This is lower than both Australia and Canada, and only slightly higher than Mongolia, the most sparsely populated country globally. However, Namibia's population distribution becomes even more peculiar upon closer inspection. Unlike Mongolia which is sparsely populated due to its central landlocked location between the harsh climates of Siberia and the Gobi Desert, Namibia is not landlocked. In fact it boasts the 10th longest coastline on the African continent. In most coastal countries a significant portion of the population resides near the coast due to economic benefits such as maritime trade, access to fishing resources and tourism opportunities. In the 21st century over 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline. The United States and China serve as typical examples with around 60% of their populations residing in coastal areas. Yet, Namibia stands as an exception, particularly along its coastline, which is surprisingly abandoned. This stark contrast to the population distribution norm in Africa is intriguing. The majority of Namibians live deep within the interior, hundreds of kilometers away from the coast. Approximately half of Namibia's small population resides in the landlocked northern region, immediately adjacent to the border with Angola. This is the population core of Namibia. However, despite that, the capital and largest city, Windhoek, is a tiny dot of high density way down here hundreds of kilometers away in the dead center of the country, surrounded by basically nothing and nobody in every direction. Windhoek is a big, modern city, home to nearly half a million people, which is about one in five Namibians. However, it's also the only actual city in the country. Everywhere else, there are scattered remote towns, rural communities, or literally nothingness for hundreds of kilometers, especially along the coastline, which is the most remote part of Namibia and one of the most remote places in the entire world. The many reasons why this is the case are fascinating. The first thing to understand about the Namibian coastline is that it is completely dominated by the narrow Namib Desert, from which the Namibian country takes its name. It stretches for more than 2,000 kilometers from southern Angola to northwestern South Africa. And across the entire Namibian coastline, nobody knows exactly how long this desert has existed here, but there are some estimations that it's been around since at least the time of the dinosaurs, making it the most ancient desert in the world. It is also one of the driest and most susceptible to wild temperature variations. Certain areas of the desert only manage to receive around 2 millimeters of precipitation throughout the entire year, and temperatures can range anywhere from a stable 48 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit on the coast to 113 Fahrenheit to below freezing just a little ways inland. This makes the Namib the only true desert to exist in southern Africa and also makes it one of the least hospitable locations on the planet. It exists here in this narrow strip along the Namibian coastline for a variety of factors. The southeasterly trade winds generally blow across the region from the Indian Ocean, but they have to first pass over the high slopes of the Drakensberg Mountains. In doing so, the winds lose a lot of their moisture to the mountain's eastern slope. The winds will then blow across Africa's greatest escarpment, and by the time they reach the Namib, the winds are largely hot and dry. These hot and dry winds then clash with the cold ocean current in the area known as the Benguela Current. This current forces frigid water from the dark and cold depths of the southern Atlantic to move up and then flow directly along the coastline of southern Africa, making the waters just off the coast here significantly colder than they are over in eastern Africa. Winds blowing into Namibia from the Atlantic side are, therefore, generally humid and cold. 
but when they encounter the opposing dry and hot air blowing in from the Indian Ocean, the colder and more humid Atlantic winds are forced down beneath them. This means that, rather than generating rainfall, the humid and cold Atlantic winds more often just become dense clouds and fog. The Namib Desert and, therefore, the Namibian coastline as well, is thus one of the foggiest locations on the planet. The coast here usually experiences more than 180 days a year of dense fog conditions, making the Namib coastline one of the most dangerous locations in the world for sailors to travel along. For centuries, ships that get lost or confused in the fog have been crashing and wrecking themselves here, almost since time immemorial. It's estimated that today there are more than a thousand different shipwrecks from various historical eras littering the foggy Namibian coastline. These hundreds of rusting and rotting hulks dotted across the coast are why the Namibian coastline is often referred to by its other well-known name, the Skeleton Coast. However, it's not just the fog that makes the Skeleton Coast such a dangerous hazard to sail across. It's also the fact that, for the most part, there simply aren't any human settlements nearby to where many of the shipwrecks happen. That means search and rescue operations have always been logistically challenging to carry out. Part of the other problem with Namibia's coastline is that there just aren't really any good natural harbors to choose from when considering the location to build a port. For the most part, the entire coast is smooth and directly exposed to the furies of the South Atlantic, not ideal conditions for places to park your ships. The only two exceptions are across more than 2,000 kilometers of otherwise open coastline, here at Luteritz and Walvis Bay, which are, of course, the only real two towns on the entire skeleton coast. The problem with Luteritz is that, while the area might look like a good natural harbor at first, the water there is shallow, and the bottom is full of rocks, making it not a very good option for large modern-day container vessels. That essentially leaves Walvis Bay as the only actual usable natural deep water harbor along the entire skeleton coast. That's why it's Namibia's only actual port and the second largest city after the capital, with direct highway and rail access. But immediately outside of these two areas, the rest of the coast is almost completely uninhabited by anyone. Another reason for this is the unbelievable lack of rivers. With very little rainfall, the entire Namib Desert is almost completely barren of any bodies of water on the surface. Most of the region's rivers flow underground or dry up for most of the year. There are only two rivers that flow through the Namib Desert that occasionally manage to reach the ocean, the Omaruru and, more importantly, the Swakup that sometimes flows just to the north of Windhoek and Walvis Bay. However, both of these rivers have irregular flows throughout the year and are difficult to predict. At some points, they'll just be completely dry. This scarcity of rivers makes agriculture and water sourcing difficult across nearly the entirety of Namibia. It's also why only about 1% of Namibia's landmass is considered arable and suitable for farming. The only river that's technically in Namibia and manages to flow to the ocean continuously throughout the year is the Orange River, forming the southern border with South Africa. However, the Orange River faces a significant challenge just 33 kilometers upstream from its mouth, where a series of rapids and sandbars make it unnavigable any further into the interior. Consequently, Namibia doesn't have any navigable rivers at all from the coast through the Namib Desert into the interior. This means that the only way to move goods from the empty coast to the population centers in the interior is by building out highways or railroads or flying them, all of which are more expensive options than simple maritime transport. In a sense, even though Namibia has the 10th longest coastline in Africa, it still nearly functions as a completely landlocked country. The Namib Desert and the Skeleton Coast act like huge natural barriers between the people in the interior and the ocean. If it weren't for this lucky sandbar just to the west of Walvis Bay that makes it a usable harbor, Namibia probably would be almost completely landlocked in practice. The Namib Desert is, therefore, one of the most sparsely populated and remote locations on the planet. However, fascinatingly, people have been drawn to it for the past century and a half because, as it turned out, it's also one of the most resource-rich areas on the planet. It all began back in 1866 when a farmer found a diamond on his farm around here, at the base of the Orange River within present-day South Africa, the same river that eventually flows into the Atlantic and forms the modern-day southern border of Namibia. 
That discovery eventually led to a frantic diamond rush and the establishment of the Kimberley Diamond Mine. Around 50,000 miners who moved to the area spent decades digging out this hole with nothing but their picks and shovels. The hole is claimed to be the deepest ever dug in the world by hand, and from it, the miners extracted more than 2,700 kilograms worth of diamonds. For nearly a century, the Kimberley Mine was considered to be the richest diamond mine ever discovered on the planet. Just a few years later after its initial discovery, the German Empire took over modern-day Namibia as a colony. Despite its seemingly empty appearance on the surface, the Germans were convinced that they could find similarly rich diamond deposits somewhere beneath it. The German colonists spent decades searching for diamonds in Namibia, massacring much of the area's indigenous tribes for resisting them, like the Nama and Herero. Around 80,000 of them were massacred in a period of only four years between 1904 and 1908, events that the modern German government would eventually formally recognize as a genocide more than a century later in 2021, for which Germany agreed to pay more than 1 billion euros in reparations. It turned out in 1908, however, that the Germans had been right about their diamond hunch in the territory all along. The Namib Desert was absolutely loaded with diamonds but not in the way that people thought. They weren't found underground like they were in Kimberley, South Africa, but within the shifting sands of the Namib Desert's dunes and across the beach near the town of Luteritz, as it would later be revealed. While the skeleton coast may be an almost completely barren wasteland on the surface, its shoreline is also covered in diamonds. The diamonds likely all originated back in the high plateau of central South Africa hundreds of kilometers to the east. Over tens of millions of years of geologic time, these diamonds would gradually trickle into the Orange River and flow down into the Atlantic Ocean. The Bengala Current would then take them up and deposit them all along the Namib Desert's coastline or on the shallow ocean floor directly adjacent to it. The Germans gradually figured this all out, and they transformed Namibia into their prime diamond-producing colony right before World War I began, where the South Africans invaded and occupied the whole thing. Namibia would be occupied by the apartheid regime in South Africa for the next 75 years and would only achieve total independence in 1990, making it the final country in Africa to become an independent nation from the era of colonialism. It was relatively easy for the South Africans to occupy and control Namibia due to the geographic reasons I explained, there was hardly anybody there. By 1990, Namibia's population was only about 1.4 million people, while South Africa's was 37 million. White South Africans who ruled and dominated the country throughout the apartheid era still numbered more than 5 million in 1990, three and a half times the entire population of Namibia back then. Throughout Namibia's history of colonial rule, millions of carats worth of diamonds were exported from the country, plucked from the beaches near the coast or dredged up from the ocean floor right next to it. As of 2021, Namibia is still the eighth largest producer of diamonds in the world by volume of carats and the sixth largest producer of diamonds by revenue since most of Namibia's diamonds are considered higher quality than average. The quantities of diamonds harvested from the Namib Desert are likely to continue increasing. The De Beers Corporation, the primary company collaborating with the Namibian government in the diamond industry today, recently introduced a new ship to their fleet in March of 2022 called the Bengala Gem, named after the same Bengala current that deposited millions of diamonds across the Namibian coast. This ship is the largest undersea diamond recovery vessel in the world and it cost $420 million to build. After its introduction in Namibia, its ability to dredge up unprecedented volumes of diamonds from the ocean floor already contributed to Namibia's diamond harvest increasing by 67% in the second quarter of 2022. This rate, if expanded upon, could bump the country up into the top five diamond-producing states in the world. Of course, it isn't just diamonds that can be found across the otherwise empty Namib desert, there are strategic resources as well, like uranium. As it would eventually turn out, the Namib Desert also has a lot of uranium. The Rossing Mine, located just 70 kilometers away from the coastline and deep within the otherwise empty desert, turned out to be the fifth largest uranium mine ever discovered on the planet. It produces around 8% of the world's supply of uranium and, with multiple other smaller mines, Namibia is currently the second largest producer of uranium in the world. 
Uranium is Namibia's number one export by a wide margin, the vast majority of which it sells to China and, to a lesser extent, to France. This uranium is the fuel that has powered nuclear plants across both China and France for decades now, and its existence has further contributed to the Namib Desert becoming an ever more important place on the world stage than it was ever considered to be before. In early 2022, another earth-battering discovery was made here that will likely change Namibia's destiny, importance, and population forever into the future. Namibia is a country that has never produced a single barrel of oil in its entire history. However, the presence of rich offshore oil fields in neighboring Angola, just to the north, has long fueled hunches that there could be similar reserves off the Namibian coast. This is a 21st century version of the diamond hunch held by the Germans back in the 19th century. Shell and the French energy major total each conducted exploration missions for years without finding significant volumes. However, suddenly in February 2022, right before the Russians invaded Ukraine, they made the discovery of a lifetime in an area known as the Orange Basin. With Namibia's exclusive economic zone, EEZ, just beyond the mouth of the Orange River, they discovered an offshore field that, according to some analysts, could contain up to 11 billion barrels of recoverable oil. That's a lot of oil, and if true, it would, in the blink of an eye, transform Namibia from a country that has never produced any oil into one of the top 20 globally by reserves and the third largest in sub-Saharan Africa. This would put it roughly on par with reserves found in neighboring Angola, whose own production is nearly equivalent to Africa's top oil producer, Nigeria. Shell, Total, and Namibia have each announced plans to begin oil production within four years, by 2026. If their production volumes can reach up to near the 1.2 million barrels a day that Angola currently achieves, it could become challenging news for countries like Russia, which has been attempting to hold the European Union hostage by withdrawing its own energy supplies. Namibian oil is potentially so vast that it could end up substituting more than half of the entire oil supply that Russia exports to the European Union. This discovery has just been added to the world's known supply. Namibia may end up being invited to join OPEC as a result, alongside other oil-rich African states like Angola, Nigeria, and Equatorial Guinea. Namibian government officials have projected that this once-in-a-lifetime oil and gas discovery could end up doubling the entire Namibian GDP by as soon as 2040 and create many high-paying jobs for Namibians. However, it's not without controversy. Due to its long history of being exploited by outside colonizers until the 1990s, Namibia is already ranked as the second most economically unequal country on the planet, trailing only its even more unequal neighbor, South Africa. The Namibian government itself only owns about a 10% stake in projects involving the nation's plentiful natural resources. White Namibians, making up around 5% of the country's population, continue to own around 70% of all Namibia's limited farmland. About 4,500 people in Namibia, descended from European colonists, own nearly half of the land in the country. In many ways, Namibia is still a country dominated and exploited by colonialism, and there are well-placed concerns that the massive oil and gas discoveries made last year by European energy companies could only end up further exacerbating those trends. Whichever way it plays out, Namibia and its small scattered population will undoubtedly be one of the most important countries to keep an eye on in this new year and throughout the rest of the 21st century. That's all for today. If you found this informative, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Labada for more engaging content.